Good morning. I'm so thankful for our early risers, and I trust that you will not be disappointed. Today we have a distinguished speaker who is excited to talk to you and hear your questions. And thank goodness for Zoom, as it makes it possible for us to connect from almost any location. My name is Barbara Velasquez, and it is my honor to welcome you and introduce today's speaker and Metropolitan Community College's observance of LGBTQIA plus Pride Month. LGBTQIA plus is an inclusive term that includes people of all genders and sexualities, such as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning, queer, intersex, asexual, pansexual, and allies. While each letter stands for a specific group of people, the term encompasses the entire spectrum of gender fluidity and sexual identities. LGBTQIA pride is currently celebrated each year in the month of June to honor the 1969 Stonewall Uprising in Manhattan. The Stonewall Uprising was a tipping point for the gay liberation movement in the United States. Today's celebrations include pride parades, picnics, parties, workshops, symposia, and concerts, and the events attract millions of participants around the world. Also, memorials are held during these months for those members of the community who were lost to hate crimes or HIV AIDS. The purpose of the commemorative month is to recognize the impact that members of the LGBTQIA plus community have had on his history locally, nationally, and internationally. Your microphones are silenced. Please use the chat function to send communications to moderator Barbara Velasquez. Rabbi Sandra Lawson, she, her, works with senior staff, lay leaders, clergy, rabbinical students, and reconstructionist communities to help reconstructing Judaism realize its deeply held aspiration of becoming an anti-racist organization and movement. In her role, Lawson is developing a series of anti-racist policies and trainings for the organization and its affiliate members. She also serves as a mentor to rabbinical students. She is a 2018 Reconstructionist Rabbinical College graduate and one of the first African-American queer female rabbis. The thought leader has consciously sought to alter the perception of what a rabbi and the rabbinate look like. Lawson is known for tackling difficult questions surrounding Jews and race in podcasts, essays, media appearances, and speeches. She's a social media pioneer, and she models what it means to teach the Torah in digital spaces. She has built a following of more than 50,000 people on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, and TikTok. In 2020, the Forward named Lawson to its Forward 50, proclaiming her a truth teller. Prior to joining Reconstructing Judaism, Lawson served as the Associate Chaplain for Jewish Life and the Senior Jewish Educator at Hillel at Alon University in North Carolina. She is also the founder of Kol Happening, All Faces, and an inclusive Jewish community that is relevant, accessible, and rooted in tradition, where all who are welcomed, and where all who come, I'm sorry, are welcomed, and diversity is embraced. Lawson was born in St. Louis, Missouri, and grew up in a military family. She graduated from Florida St. Leo University Magna Cum Laude with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology. She also holds a Master of Arts degree in Sociology from Clark Atlanta University. Lawson served in the U.S. Army as a military police person with a specialty in military police investigations. She specialized in cases involving child abuse and domestic violence. Upon leaving the military, she started a personal training business and later worked as an adjunct instructor of sociology at local community colleges. She has also served as the investigative researcher for the Anti-Defamation League Southeast Region, becoming the go-to person when law enforcement in the South needed information on hate groups. 
Lawson lives in North Carolina with her wife, Susan, and three fur babies, Izzy, Bridget, and Simon. So I'm, I know Rabbi Lawson said that her bio was very long, but I hope you appreciate learning about all of her accomplishments. Please welcome Rabbi Sandra Lawson for her presentation, Black, Jewish, and Queer, Navigating Judaism with Multiple Identities and Building Bridges. Hi, thank you. Um, um, it's always interesting hearing my bio read, and I just have to tell you that my wife was went to the grocery store, and um, actually that's not true. She went to pick blackberries or blueberries. This is local farm, and the dogs, while you we're having this internal freak out and I just called her and I said, are you here? And she's like, yes. I said, can you please come in now and make the dogs be quiet? Because <laughs> um, I usually freak out like that if one of us is outside. So anyway, so I do have one dog here with me if you know, and she just usually sits down as Bridget um, and is pretty quiet until about five o'clock when she realizes that all the attention should go to her. Okay, so I just wanted to be a little transparent because I was having my own kind of freak out. Anyway, thank you so much for having me. The blessings of this weird world we're living in is that I get to meet people um, via via Zoom. Um, and I, I, I like to sing and, and the Judaism has a very rich history of, of, of singing uh, prayers. Most of our prayers are actually sung. Um, and um, also, it sort of calms me down and relaxes me. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm a great singer. There's a difference between <laughs> singing and being a great singer. Um, and before before you all came on this call, I was just telling um, Joseph and Barbara that I have a variety of microphones to try to deal with the Zoom effect. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Anyway, so it's Pride Month. Happy Pride. Um, and I, you know, I'm Black queer Jewish woman, and I'm going to sing the song for you that I wrote for my mother who passed away um, uh, a couple years ago. And I um, and she heard it and loved it. Um, but I, I come from a mother who told me to never let anybody tell me I can't to do something. And a father who um, said that I always dared to be different. Uh, so I dedicate this to all of the women on this call, the people who identify as women, um, daughters, granddaughters, and people raising female identified people. And so this is, here we go. When I was young, my mama said to me, when I was young, my mama said to me, you can be anything you want to be so i joined the u.s army so i could fight for my country because you can be anything you want to be Then I got me a graduate degree. Now I'm a rabbi, look at me. Because I can be anything I want to be. When I was young, my mama said to me, when I was young, my mama said to me, actually, I got to tell you something. When I would sing that, my mom would say, wait, when I was young, my mama said to me, here's my mom, what'd she say? What'd she say? You can be anything you want to be. So one day I said to my daughter, what? my mama said to me and she looked into my eyes and she said i will be anything i want to be because you could be 
anything you wanted to be. Thank you. Okay. okay. There goes that microphone. <laughs> Still hear me? We're not hearing you right now, Rabbi. We lost you, lost your sound. I forgot to make the switch in my computer. Um, I like that microphone for um, podcast and singing, uh, but I don't like it for Zoom because it's big and I feel like it disrupts my view. Um, so like I said, it, it really is an honor to be here and I just love talking with people. And I said I wrote that song because I had a mother who, who I remember telling me from a very young age, never let anybody tell you that you can't do something and I um a father who told me that I reminded him of his my great-grandfather a man I never met um he just called me one day out of the blue uh as dads do sometimes and he's like you remind me of my grandfather and I was like what do you mean he's like well he just dared to be different and and then that was the end of that conversation <laughs> Um, I joke with him about that sometimes, but you know, I, it's, you know, especially during pride month, it's just an, a reminder of, you know, when we let, um, young people be who they are supposed to be, they will often amaze us in ways that we could never imagine. Um, so I am a rabbi and because we are, um, getting to know each other and, I didn't do, we didn't go around the room introducing ourselves. I want to, I'm always trying to find ways to, to, you know, sort of, uh, build connection in this Zoom world. And one way to do that is to offer, um, a morning, a, a blessing of gratitude. Um, Judaism is filled with blessings of gratitude. We have a blessing when you wake up in the morning, we have, uh, a blessing which I'm going to talk about later for uh, uh, when we go to the bathroom in the morning <laughs> we have uh, a blessing even thanking God for giving birds the, the birds of dawn the discernment to tell day from night and so I'm going to offer one of those blessings it's called Moda Ani um, and if you want to learn a little bit of Hebrew Moda is the feminine and Mode is the masculine Hebrew is a binary uh, language, gender binary language, and some people are working on changing that. Um, and a moda means basically thank you. So I'm going to offer the blessing and take some liberties in translating. So if you go to somebody and say, I learned his blessing, and this is what it was, I'm not translating this directly because I want to make it relevant to us. Moda ani lafanecha ruacha vechayam shezarta bi nishmati bechem lacha raba emunatecha. And the gist of that prayer means thank you, divine source of all, for restoring our, my soul, our souls, breathing life into me, into all of us. And the best part of this is the last line, which means, which is a reminder that you, the divine source, you God, are awesome. Um, so I offer the, the, that blessing of gratitude and the song dedicated to my mother. Um, to um to sort of remind us to always be grateful and i really believe that if you start your day off with gratitude that it's it's hard to um be angry like you know many many religious uh traditions have a call to prayer and our in judaism we have all these blessings of gratitude before we get to our call to prayer, and I believe it's so that we will be open to receiving the blessings and ready for prayer. And I often tell, especially young people, because um, I got so much energy, <laughs> sometimes angry energy, sometimes excitement or whatever, you know, that you, when we wake up in the morning, we could say oi, which means like bad things in, in Yiddish. We could say oi, this day sucks. Or we could say, wow, how awesome is this day? Um, and even if you wake up 
saying, boy, this day sucks. If you offer the blessings and gratitude that are part of our tradition, that are woven in our tradition, it's hard to still be, to be angry. You, you will find yourself more grateful for the day. So even though I'm spending a lot of time talking about God, I actually <laughs> spent most of my life not giving to whatever, to not even thinking twice about what it means um, to have spirituality or to think about God or religion. I grew up in a secular uh, military family. Uh, we moved around a lot. My parents raised my brother and I in a non, like seriously, a non-religious home. My parents grew up dirt poor in, in the South. Um, during the Jim Crow era from an, a family of sharecroppers. In fact, I didn't, I grew up in the Midwest and I didn't realize that my parents were Southerners. I mean, I knew where we visited our grandparents, but it wasn't until I moved to Alabama and I was like, oh my God, these people sound like my parents. Um, and I, and I didn't, I, I just didn't realize like how, how Southern they were. And my dad now lives in Arkansas black man, cowboy boot wearing, cowboy hat, baseball cat, like he could be a trucker or uh, uh, someone who rides horses and he's done all those things too. Um, and so I come from that stock with, you know, parents who, like I said, grew up dirt poor in the South, but still instilled in my brother and I that we could, we could, we could do anything as long as we set our mind to it. It doesn't mean life is easy. It just means like if you set your mind to something that you can make it accomplish, make it happen. And so today I'm a well-known, respected rabbi. I work for a national Jewish organization. Um, and I, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but I'm saying all this stuff because especially during Pride Month, that if we raise young people to believe that they can truly be anything, they will rise and accomplish more than we could ever imagine. All of this brings me to another blessing. Um, we have this blessing in Hebrew called a Sheri uh, And it's a prayer that I mentioned earlier about um, a prayer thanking God for allowing ourselves to go to the bathroom in the morning. It's a, it's a prayer, um, the gist of the prayer is a prayer is offering thanks to the God who formed us it's a prayer we offer when we do our business in the morning. And, um, and it's often just called the bathroom blessing. If you ask a Jew who prays regularly and they say, can you tell me, teach me the bathroom blessing? They'll know exactly what you mean. The, the blessing in, in English starts off with blessed are you God who formed me with wisdom and fashioned the human body. Um, I'm a reconstructionist rabbi and if you have questions about what that means i'm happy to answer that later oh i forgot to say something too i mentioned to barbara and um joseph before, yesterday um that you know if you and, and i think Bar, i think barbara's going to get some of these questions and sorry about the pause but if you have a burning question i don't mind being interrupted i mean rabbis spend most of their lives being interrupted so it doesn't bother me but if you have a burning question um uh, if you could use the reactions feature, raise your hand and I can see you. I'm not checking the chat um, and I don't want anybody to feel ignored. Um, but if there's something you really want to ask, do that and I'll, I'll stop and ask you, you to ask your question or you can send it to Barbara and Barbara might find a, a good time. Okay, anyway, so I'm a reconstructionist rabbi and like I said, I can say more about what that means. But part of how I see my, my role in the broader network of Judaism or in Jewish life um, especially when I work with young people, is to find ways to reconstruct our tradition, our text, our liturgy, to help people see that it's it's relevant today. And that prayer that I mentioned called Al, Al Sheri Atzar is it's a prayer about the body. And the the mo most of the prayer in English is Blessed are you, God, who formed me with wisdom, fashioned the human body, creating openings, arteries, glands, and org organs marvelous in structure and structure it is revealed and known before you uh, that if one of these passageways be open when it should be closed and blocked up when it should be free i could not stay alive or stand before your glory for even just an hour blessed are you god the healer um, of all flesh who sustains our bodies in wondrous ways 
this prayer, I had heard it in synagogue, mumbled all over the place. You know, people, Judaism often gets mumbled in more observant places, but I never paid attention to it until that first or second year in rabbinical school when I really had to take a deep dive in all of our liturgy. And from day one, when I started diving into this, I'm like, for me, this was more than a bath and blessing. Um, it, it became my favorite blessing and still is my favorite blessing. I liked it so much that when I went to Israel to study, because that's what rabbis have to do, you have to go to uh, sort of spend a significant amount of time in Israel to study. Um, I spent extra time learning about the history of this, this blessing and what our uh, rabbinic tradition says. So Judaism is uh, a tradition of what rabbis have had to say throughout the centuries is kind of the short way I'll put it today. Um, and so remembering that this is a bathroom blessing, when I started diving into our text about what the rabbis say about the bathroom blessing, a lot of it was actually quite comical. And I, um, I, I can't share some of the things I learned because it, it might be a little bit embarrassing, but there's just some really funny things about what um, our rabbis say, which is another reminder that the rabbis that we uphold, uh, lift up, we shouldn't take them so seriously. They were human beings just like we are, and they had a sense of humor. Um, so, um, as I said, I've never seen this just as a bathroom blessing. I saw this blessing as a prayer um, telling me that I can be exactly who I am. I'm exactly who God created me to be. Um, I'm a, a wonderful, my body is just how it's designed to be. I am um, who I am supposed to be. Um, and which for me is a black Jewish uh, queer woman and today a rabbi. And in those identities, I represent um, groups that are continuously targeted by violence and sadly often murder. Even though I don't spend every waking hour thinking about my identity, uh, I am well aware that I live in a society that sees my blackness before they see me or get to know me and my Jewishness in a Christian centric society often represents a threat. Because of my experiences and in the intersections of my identity, I see my relationship to social service, social activism, and social justice as an obligation. Now, in Jewish spaces, people often ask me, what is it, your Jewish values? Because Judaism is, you know, there's so much social justice in Judaism. Is, are, is your commitment to all those things shaped? Or because, are you doing those things because of your Jewish values? And what I often say is, um, I see this as an obligation, not because of my Jewish values. I'm obligated because as a queer black woman living in the United States, I don't believe I have the privilege um, of being silent or to ignore or simply not see the injustices in our larger society. My Jewish values, however, do provide me with tools and a foundation to try to do my part to make the world a little better. And Judaism keeps me grounded and uh, centers me and allows me to reset. We've been through a lot in the last few years, uh, things that I'm sure our younger selves would have never imagined. Um, we've suffered through a pandemic. Um, I'm still, I have a television over here that you can't see that's um, talking about the, the, uh, the hearings um, and a, a, you know, a, a learning about a president um, and people working for the president that are behaving in ways that I would have never imagined people in leadership to behave. Um, our country is also in a sort of another state of racial reckoning, um, causing many, many, that racial reckoning I mentioned, causing many people um, to realize, realize that racism 
continues in our society. And the Jewish community is not exempt from that. At the very beginning of the pandemic, I was a campus rabbi. Now, I don't know if you have a rabbi on your campus, but campus rabbi life is actually kind of cool. It's a pretty cool gig, yes, from my experience. I don't, I can't speak for all campus rabbis. But when I took the job, I even asked, like, is this a real job? Like, the, the, the job description was like, how would you like to spend your days having coffee with students and taking them to lunch? Um, you know, and listening to students and, and planning, you know, planning Shabbat. And I really called the HR person and said, is this a real job? Um, and I also told them I had no campus experience, but what I do have is a lot of chaplaincy experience. And they said that my chaplain experience um, was from me. Well, but like college students need people to listen to them. And I got to do that. And it was pretty cool. And then the pandemic hit and like everybody else, I had to figure out how to do my job via Zoom, which I got to tell you, I was not ready for it and nobody was ready for it. I remember having lots of discussions about what I would do, what I wouldn't do, confidentiality and all that other stuff. And I had to like be more flexible. Um, so as I said, I was a campus chaplain. And um, as, 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 as mentioned, when I mentioned in that song and in my bio, I was, I was in the military. Um, I've worked in law enforcement. I've worked as law enforcement in, in the military. I worked in law worked with civilians while I was in the military. Most of my time in, in law enforcement, um, I, in the military, I actually spent in civilian clothes working with um, our, civi our civilian partners. I have a graduate degree in sociology and uh, I was a researcher for the Anti-Defamation League. Uh, and my job was to work with law enforcement even in that. Um, and I'm saying all this stuff, not to tout, tout my bona fides, but I became, uh, this th that sort of unique background um i found myself in a unique situation to explain to help explain this particular moment in time i was i was getting calls from jewish organizations and uh, uh jewish congregations to help explain this i got calls asking um can you can, rabbi can you talk to our community uh and tell me why people are protesting in the street. Now, keep in mind, these are mostly white people and white congregations. Um, can you come and talk to our community about why uh, why people are continuing to say Black Lives Matter? I thought all lives matter. Um, I don't understand. I thought racism was over. Um, why are people so angry? And sadly, some even said to me, um, that we that they can't support Black Lives Matter because they found it anti-Semitic, and because I am a, uh, a a Black Jewish person, Jewish communities found it safe to talk to me about these things and, and help them. In my background that I mentioned earlier, you know, especially with all the conversations around security and law enforcement, I could help Jewish communities walk through this unique time and um, help unpack some really difficult conversations that people needed to have or wanted to have or to understand. And I think, and what I've learned part of that, why this was so, so hard is that people still, people live in bubbles. You know, um, many people think that their white experience or many Jews think their white experience of going through the day is, is a universal experience. That's not the case. Black and brown people do not walk through our society in the same ways um, that white people do. So I use my background and my um, intersectionality um, and all of that to help to try to build bridges and to help many in the Jewish community understand, um, like I said, that black and brown people don't have the same experiences in our society. I helped white Jews to understand that BIPOC, uh, black and indigenous people of and pe black indigenous and people of color, Jews are often not safe are, are made to not feel safe in Jewish spaces. And that was a really hard pill to swallow for people who believe that their, their spaces were safe and welcoming. Uh, and I'm not saying, that I don't want you to believe that Jewish spaces are walking around trying to keep people out or we, we don't want people in. They just didn't realize that some of their policies were actually not inclusive. And I found myself in this moment um, traveling all over Zoom, like, one day, I was not in this order, but one day 
I was on a Zoom call with rabbis in Israel, so we were going back and forth in Hebrew and English, which is nerve-wracking. Um, but I found myself on a Zoom call with rabbis and progressive rabbis in Israel. A few hours later, I was in a, um, on a Zoom call with a congregation in California. And then a few hours later, I was, um, again, I don't think this is the right order. I was on a um, day of learning talk with folks predominantly on the East Coast. And I was pretty much answering the same questions or at least having the same type of talk. Um, which was helping white Jews understand racism today, helping them understand racism today, understand how racism has evolved and um, understand white, understanding whiteness and how whiteness has evolved over time. And another reason that I can do this is as a rabbi, um, I have, I have faced racism, homophobia, sexism, and all the intersections of that uh, multiple times, some of it more blatant than others. Um, and um, I have had some heartache, some, some painful things that I've had to deal with, all related to those issues. Didn't get jobs that I know that I was qualified for. In fact, even um, was basically ready to sign the contract and um, racism interfered. And going back to my parents, I took all of that disappointment because you know my mother's child, my dad's child. And I remember telling my wife that I was really upset, especially when there was a job that, that I was asked to apply for and I was uniquely um, uh, qualified for. All rabbis have skills and some rabbis have particular sets of skills and I have a particular set of skills that a lot of rabbis don't have. And there's rabbis that have skills that I don't have. But I remember telling her, and we were in, a, in the bedroom, and she's like, are you okay? And I said, I'm really angry right now, and I'm gonna, I need to mourn this, I need to cry, but I'm going to do something with this because I'm fed up. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something. Uh, and when the world changed, and I, like I said, was traveling all over Zoom, um, I reached out to um, the Reconstructionist Movement. Um, well, let me back up in it. I started doing some research on Jewish organizations that I love and trust, and none of them had um, what I would call a diversity of staff. Most of their staff was white, most of their senior staff was white, and if they were black and brown people in their staff, they were janitorial staff. And I was like, what, the, what is this? Like, these are organizations that claim to support queer people, brown people, women. Some of these, some of them I was shocked were still overwhelmingly male. Um, and so, um, I went to our movement, which would you say movement is just basically means denomination. And I said, we don't have any black and brown people on senior staff. And they're like, you're right. Now keep in mind, going to the reconstructors movement for me, it's like talking to my friends, talking to, um, people who used to teach me. So it wasn't like I was calling some big hierarchical place. Like I know how to reach the, at the time I knew how to reach the president. Um, and I said, I have an idea. I said, if you hire me, I can get the money <laughs> to support this role for two years. And then you have to step in the rest. Um, and they knew, they knew what grant I was talking about because they could not apply for the grant because to apply for the grant, you actually need a person of color. So, um, I basically came to a job that I got to, to, to define and it's the um, Director of Racial Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And uh, my job now is to try to do my best that all of the racism that I experience um, doesn't, or happens less. It doesn't happen as often. I wish I could say I could eradicate it, but that's not the reality. Uh, that's not gonna happen in my lifetime. And, um, and so I, I work with rabbinical students, so future rabbinical students. I help to make sure that our that our intern our internships for our rabbinical students uh, help. I I try to to um, lessen the racism. Basically, what what happens now, which didn't happen before, is that if you want an internship, if you want a rabbinical student from the Reconstructionist movement, you have to understand that our students come in a variety of 
genders, race, and 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 colors and um, uh, backgrounds in Judaism, and that you should be focused on their skills and not about their color or not about their how they came to Judaism um, or you know. And if you don't abide by our rules. <laughs> you're not going to get a student, which is, you know, that seems very simple, but that nobody thought about it that before. I now work with, I also work with our congregations to help, help our congregations understand what racism looks like in the Jewish community, understand what homophobia looks like in the Jewish community, um, and give them shared language. So they're, they're all on the same page. Before I arrived, if I was talking to a community, you know, they all see themselves great, but they're like, oh yeah, we're doing so much work on racial justice. And then I do a deep dive and talking to them for five minutes. I'm like, oh my God, you have so much more work to do. You're not doing anything really. Um, or I have other conversations where people are like, well, I'm, just not, I'm, not, I'm not doing enough. And I talk to them like, oh my God, you're actually doing more. And the reason you feel like you're not doing enough is because this work is hard. And if you're walking around doing racial justice work and it's easy, you're not doing it right. <laughs> Um, this involves physical and emotional labor. Um, and, and and if you're not doing that, that's okay. Just be honest about it. You know, be honest about what's actually happen, happening. And the only way to move towards anti-racism or homophobia is to, um, or sexism or any of these isms, is to, um, you have to actively be working to not be those things, either emotionally or physically. Um, because if not, then you're, this is why I say that um, people say I'm not racist. I'm like, there's, there's no such thing. You either, you either moving towards anti-racism or are racist. There's, there's, there's no like, I'm not racist. That, that, and if you think that's a thing, it's, it's, we could talk about that. Okay, so um, almost gonna wrap up here. Um, but I want to give a little Torah. Um, one of the beautiful things that I love about Judaism is, uh, and there's actually a lot of things, this isn't the only thing, but one of the things I love about Judaism is that every week uh, we as Jews are connected in our study of the weekly Torah portion. So Jews who engage in this Torah study, we are all reading the same text at the same time, which means that whatever we're reading, we're, we, we, you know, whatever we're struggling with, I can call a friend and say, did you read this line? And um, we're also filtering it through our modern, whatever's going on in our lives. And I've had people, young people say to me, like, aren't you tired of reading the same thing over and over again? I said, yeah, but it's so different. Like, <laughs> it's different than last year. You know, like, can you imagine reading the text associated with, with um, Passover and actually being in a plague? Like... <laughs> You're going to definitely see that text way different than you would have when you just thought about the plague of blood and boils and frogs. Like, no, we're actually in a real pandemic. So this week's Torah portion is a Torah portion called Shalak, Shalak, Shalak Lecha, which basically means um, to send out. And it's in, it starts in Numbers 13, if you want to read the, this, and it, if you want to read it. And it kind of, it's, it's, I call this Torah portion, Sisi Poide, or Yes, We Can. Um, many of you, some of you may remember when Barack Obama was running for president. Um, and if you don't know this, you just probably Google, you could probably watch videos of it. But he would go to rallies and people, and then say, yes, we can. I mean, the first black, successful black candidate running for uh, a presidential office to be on a major ticket um, and it rallies, yes, we can, yes, we can, yes, we can. And depending on the audience, they might be saying, si, si, puede, si, si, puede. Um, and uh, that was like the rallying cry, like basically, yes, we can. Back to my mother, don't let anybody tell you you can't do something. And this week's tour portion that I mentioned is all about courage and it reads like an old-fashioned spy novel at least that's how i read it so god tells moses to send uh scouts out to the promised land and moses chooses 12 men to go to the promised land to see whether it is conquerable or in and in, inhabitable uh, 10 of these men come back frightened scared they and, and saying that it's impossible to conquer this land, 
the land because uh, they believe that the people inhabiting the land were like giants and those people saw us as grasshoppers two of the men uh joshua and caleb uh, come back saying si, si, puede. we can do it yes we can um and they were ready to fight and they were ready to conquer the land um the 10 men who lacked courage saw themselves very small saying we are grasshoppers in the eyes of the inhabitants of the land and in their own eyes i saw themselves as small they lacked courage uh, the self-confidence it takes to do what is required um wait they lack the courage and the self-confidence it takes to do what is required and they they lacked faith and they lacked faith in god because earlier god is like i got your back just go check it out i'm going to take care of you but they were scared um and which caused and their being scared caused scare in the entire community and basically after that the israelites were condemned uh the to wander in the desert for 40 more years because God realized that they weren't ready to uh, to uh, to have faith, um, and they they still kind of had some kind of enslavement mentality. Um, the lesson that we learned, a lesson that I learned today from this Torah portion, um, is that. Um, if we believe that we can do something, we can. If we don't, then we won't. It's all about attitude. It's all about confidence. Um, change is not easy. Change in our society is not easy. You think about it, we sometimes we take two steps forward and take a couple steps back, but we keep struggling and moving forward. But we must continue to believe that change is possible. Um, and if we, if all we can see are failure like those 10 men um, we will absolutely fail we must always to, uh, try to think positively fight continue to fight for change demand our seat at the table and believe that change will come and the civil, civil rights activists uh, that were part of the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s believed that change would come and when we do we can conquer whatever comes our way. And so as a black queer rabbi, um, I take this and everything that I've mentioned to believe that, um, that anything is possible if we have the courage. Um, and like my mother said, um, never let anyone tell you that you can't do something. So um, in Hebrew, I would say uh, a word called shemati, which means I have spoken. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm going to stop there. Um, I was going to sing a song, but I don't, I'm not going to, because I actually want to hear from you. Um, and so, um, and I'm, I'm, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. So whatever you, whatever your questions are. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rabbi Lawson. Um, we have... Uh, some questions that have come in. Um, you told us about your both your parents and growing up military and um, in, in St. Louis. Were your parents Jewish or was that your choice? How did you become um, familiar with Judaism? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, before I answer that question, or I may not answer that question, um, I'm going to ask why is that question, whoever asked that question, if they want to volunteer why they're asking that question and be honest let's see if we can find um Martha uh Joe would you like to open Martha's okay she wrote in because uh, it sees you choose your I, I don't know that I understood what you wrote. Something about choosing your faith. But okay. um, Joe, if you'd like to open, Martha, would you like to speak to this question? Yes. 
Yay. I can just listen to you. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank Rabbi for uh, sharing. Uh, and uh, I, I grew up with the same kind of message from my mom uh, that, you know, I could accomplish whatever I set out to do. So, uh -huh. yeah, it makes a big difference. And I, I've raised my four adult children the same way and my grandchildren and great grandchildren. But the reason I ask is because um, I embrace Judaism uh, and I work a lot with the Jewish community here in Omaha. And uh, I find a real um, kinship with faith, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Jewish faith. And so um, I think it's important for people to be open and uh, they don't have to necessarily choose uh, the faith of their parents or if their parents didn't have a particular faith. Uh, that it's important for every human being to choose how they desire to worship God. So, so I just was curious. No, that's great. Okay. So um, it's probably not going to answer your question, but I'll say this. Um, Judaism doesn't fit neatly into our modern definition of what a religion is. Basically, how we define religion today is a Christian-centric way of defining religion. Um, the Israelites that left Mitzrayim, that left the, 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 the place of pain, the place of constriction, many people call that Egypt, but I don't use that anymore. I mean, think about it. When we think of Jews, we have to think of white Jews leaving enslavement from an African-centric African country that doesn't bold well, so I just use the Hebrew. Um, and, um, we, and, and when we left Mitzrayim, made our way to Mount Sinai, we became a people. Before that, we were a bunch of different groups of people. Some of us were Israelites, some of us were probably Egyptian, some of us uh, threw our lot in with, um, you know, would rather follow Moses and not be in a capitalistic society of Mitzrayim. There could have been lots of reasons, but there were a bunch of different people that left. In this narrative, there was a bunch of people, different people that left um, and made their way to Mount Sinai. And on that mountain, we received the Torah, um, the Ten Commandments and the Torah and so much more. Um, and we became a people, one people, um, Jews, basically. And that even that word comes around later. Christianity comes around centuries later and calls us a religion. So today we are a people and a religion. So with that definition in mind, you can, um, be a part of the people and not practice the religion. But the reverse can't be true. You can't practice the religion and not be part of the people. So when people might say, I'm just culturally Jewish or I'm atheist Jew, you know, you're just Jewish. Like there's no, there's really no like difference. It's just that how people see their, see their Jewishness. Um, the other reason why I'm not going to answer that question is that Jews who look like me get questions like that all the time. Like I can't go in a Jewish space without being asked that question. And when I'm going to throw some numbers at you, all of you, if you look at Jews globally, more Jews look like me than y'all. I vote I can not vote the majority of y'all on, on the screen. So globally, Jews are brown. That has not necessarily been the case in the United States, but the first wave of Jews that came to the United States during George Washington's time were probably closer to my complexion. Um, they assimilated, um, they were responsible for creating some of the earliest uh, synagogues in this country. And, um, and then after that, the other waves of, Judeas, of Jews came from Europe. The culture that we have in American Judaism is often based on Eastern Europe culture. So the food that we think of as Jewish food, no, it's actually comes from Eastern Europe. The food that we think of, the practices that we think of as Jews is actually, no, it's Eastern European Jews. Um, there are a variety of cultures in, in Judaism. Um, and oh, also what I say, I want to say is that because of, we don't fit neatly into that definition, one word that often gets thrown around is that Judaism is an ethno religion. So an ethnicity and a religion. Um, okay. Um, so, so there, there are Sephardic Jews, Jews that came from, from historically, the ancestors came from Spain. They were kicked out in 1492. Mitzrayim Jews who come from the Northern part of Africa, Ethiopian Jews, and the, I could go on and on and on. I really, so Jews who've lived in this country 
as long as we've lived in this country, um, are taking on all of the aspects of American culture. So I believe that in, in someone will be calling American Jews its own thing. And because Jews have lived in this country long enough, we we are a subset of the American population. So the same demographics that you're going to see in the American population, you're going to see in, in, <clears throat> in the Jewish community. With that said, we are about 1.9%, almost 2%. We were 2% of the American population. This is when that sociology thing comes into play. 1.9% of the American population. Um, there have been a variety of studies over the last 20 years that have put the racial demographics at anywhere between 8 to 12 to 15 to 20% of the American Jewish population are racially diverse, meaning not white. Don't get caught up on those numbers because all these studies also say that it's really hard to count Jews of color. Most of these studies people self-identify as people of color. But what they all say is that the number of black and brown Jews in the country is growing. And the Pew study, which is the second to most recent study, says that 15% of American Jews under 30 are brown. 15% of American Jews under 30 are racially diverse. That's about a million, that's about a million people. And the most recent study, which is, which is called Beyond the Count, um, says that two thirds of American, of American Jews of color were raised Jewish. So we have to get, we have to erase, and I'm not saying that you were saying this in your question, but we have to erase this idea that black and brown Jews, if you're, if you're a black or brown Jew, that you converted into Judaism. So, and I do agree that, that people, we live in America and people can choose their, um, their, their religion, their, their practices, and that the definitions of how we view religion is very is, is Christian centric and Jews don't fit neatly into that. All right, so hope that helps. Thank you. And um, Mark, that thanks you for uh, bringing in the Sephardic Jewish population mm -hmm. history. She said she is familiar with that as a mm -hmm. Cuban descent Latina. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so um, Native American popula Native Americans, some have told me that historically, uh, LGBTQ populations were considered um, special, <laughs> powerful within their communities. So my my question is, traditionally, how did Jewish people accept LGBTQ communities? So what's really interesting about that is that when Christians look at our text, we're not reading the same thing. So even though it might be translated the same, but often um, it's not the same. And I say that for one reason is because Christian texts have been translated from Hebrew to Greek into English or whatever language. And Jews, if they read Hebrew, they're reading it straight from the Hebrew. And if they don't, they're the Jew. Jewish Bibles are translated directly from the Hebrew um, and translations make choices and the most um, wide read Christian Bible is the King James Bible and you know he had a he believed in divine right of kings and so the translation completely reflects that and when people make choices um, about what the Torah says about X Christians say like one example of how we don't read these texts the same way. And since it's Pride Month, um, one of the texts, I'm not gonna talk about the Leviticus text because that gets thrown around so much. You know, one should not lie like a man, like way with a woman. I could talk about that one too, but there's another one that, that often gets thrown around, particularly for trans people, where it says, you know, something to the effect of, you know, a man should not wear women's clothing and women should not wear men's clothing. That is not what, it, that's not the translation, but that's how it's often interpreted. Judaism has never seen that as a text. There's no proof, there's no evidence in Judaism that we've ever seen that text that says that men can't dress up like women and women can't dress up like men or can't wear women's men's clothing or however we want to see that. What that text is talking about is don't try to be something that you're not. So when the rabbis wrote that text, when the rabbis look at that text and are commenting on it in the Talmud, they're saying that, that men who wear women's clothing and they're doing it for 
malicious intent, you know, maybe trying to get in the women's tent or maybe trying to, you know, sleep with somebody they shouldn't, you know, they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. And that's what's wrong, you know. It's and so, but both the two of our sages, Maimonides and and Rashi. So if if you're Jewish and you ever want to sound like you know what you're talking about, quote those two people. Basically, both of them say that that don't basically say don't try to be something you're not. And when you do that, that is what is what that is what is forbidden in the Torah. But Christians got a hold of that and made it a whole thing, which I remember early on causing a lot of, when I first started hearing that, a lot of confusion in the Jewish community. Um, and, you know, and, and, and so, um, so I'll say that to say that, like, we live, we also, we live in a modern society. So there is, in, from, as a rabbi, there is no homophobia in the Torah. People are homophobic and people can take their homophobia and translate stuff. And I've had conversations with Orthodox rabbis who agree with me as well, that they also say there's no homophobia in the Torah, but people will read it with their own biases. Um, and, and also because of that, um, well, because we live in a society that is homophobic, parts of Judaism have also taken on homophobic ideas. Um, leaning into what they believe the Torah says about gender um, and sex. Now, the, Judaism has a lot of rules about what women should do and what men shouldn't do. Um, and most of it has to do with time, literally time, and bound by Jewish law. So men are bound by Jewish law. Women are often not. And um, so women don't, from a, the most orthodox reading of our text, Women are not bound by the obligations that men have because they're closer to God and men have to work really hard to be close to God. That's one way of one way of looking at it. It's not my way of looking at it, but um, but there's no prohibition for women taking on the same roles. And that's different. So how sexism and homophobia have creeped into some of our Jewish texts. Some people have interpreted those things that say that you can't be gay or women cannot do things. And I'm talk constant on social media arguing not arguing but trying to tell people that there is no prohibition that says you can't be gay there's no prohibition that says gay people don't exist there's no prohibition saying you can't be gay there's no prohibition that the women can't be rabbis and all that those are all interpretations um based on what men should do but not prohibiting about what women should do thank you very that's i think that um your explanation and your insight is giving us a lot of food for thought. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing it in the chat also. Oh, good. You know, thank you for helping us to think about that because for me at least, um, these are none of these are real cut and dried answers, right? Mm -hmm. It takes time to contemplate. And I mean, your life has been a life probably of research into yeah. so much of this, right? <laughs> Um, we are getting close to the end, but um, in a conversation that we had earlier, Dr. Uh, Rabbi Larson, um, I'm, your focus um, in your position, of course, is to fight against racism and discrimination. Um, but I wonder sometimes if this need to fight against racism and discrimination has taken you away from other things you would like to do as a rabbi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I became a rabbi because I believe in Judaism. It is the right path for me. It is a guiding force in my life. Um, and I wanted to learn as much about it as I could. I've also faced many barriers. Now, getting into rabbinical school, now, let me rephrase, I was going to say it wasn't hard. Getting into rabbinical school is hard. Staying in rabbinical school is, even, is hard. And graduating is hard. So we're talking about years of study. Um, and so I didn't have a problem getting accepted into rabbinical school. Um, but rabbinical programs are, are not made for people like me. That, they're, they're, that doesn't mean I don't belong. But if you're so used to teaching white people or you know, in the same way that they made changes back in the day to accept women, you know, there's some, you know, there was a lot early sexism in, in, in programs. And now 
racial biases that people can't see. And so I'm committed to, so what I, what I realize is, is important is that it's not enough to accept black and brown students. We need to make sure they can survive and thrive. And so, as I mentioned earlier, when I, um, you know, hit roadblocks into applying for positions as a student um, and as a, as a rabbi, um, I, um, during the, pen, right before the pandemic, I, I created a nonprofit um, and my nonprofit, is, it does something really normal. It's called Kol Hapanim and all it does is put black and brown spiritual leaders in front of people, um, normalizing people of color as rabbis, as cantors, um, leading services, doing the things that they were trained to do. And I got this idea, uh, one, because I was fed up, but also I remember when I was a student and I was uh, the student rabbi at this old conservative congregation. And conservative is just a denomination in Judaism. And, you know, they got, you know, I was doing all the traditional stuff, singing all the traditional melodies and everything. And when I was done, some people came up to me and they're like, that was just a regular service. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, I just, you did good. That was, that was just a regular, and he even implied it was kind of boring. <laughs> like, and, and I'm thinking, and maybe we, I don't remember we joked. Actually, this guy still follows me online. He's so sweet. But it was so long ago. I'm not sure. I was wondering what he thought I was going to do up there. Um, and I've had, I've heard things like that, little subtle things. And so when people say, I can't see a black or brown rabbi, in the same way that I've heard people say to me years ago, I believe in women's, women's rights, but I just can't see a female rabbi. Well, here, here's your chance. Here, you're seeing. So this weekend, this past weekend, I did a Shabbat Juneteenth service and I hired uh, a black male identified trans person to put the service together and to lead the service. And I told him, I said, have as much creativity as you want. Um, I want people to see you. <laughs> I want you to people to see you. And he, you know, be flanked, was flanked by two other rabbis, but he was leading the service. People here, here's everybody watching, nationally watching a black trans man leading the service and they can't say anymore. I've never seen that before. Now, if they still say that, that's their own. Then they have to admit, as I said earlier, that they're a bigot. But, um, but that's all it does. It just, I hire people and I put them in front of people. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. I, um, I want to honor your time. Um, it, if you have a chance after we finish this last question, it might be helpful for our audience to know how to follow you. Yeah. If they're interested. Um, but, but my last question for you is, is there any final message you'd like to share with our audience? Well, um, you did tell me that and I kind of forgot about that, but I'll say, keep your hearts open um, to always keep your hearts open. Uh, if that's a challenge, take a deep breath beforehand. Um, listen to marginalized people um, and recognize that you may, you, the two of you may not have the same experiences. Um, happy pride. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of, I don't know, I'm not sure what to say. I'll just say that you want to, I'm pretty easy to find online. Um, all of my social media handles are the same. They're, it's Rabbi Sandra um, on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. The one difference on YouTube, you can just find me as Rabbi Sandra Lawson. I think it's like YouTube slash Rabbi Sandra Lawson. Um, they wouldn't let me put Rabbi Sandra for some reason. Um, so yeah, and, and if, if, and, if you have a burning question um, after this talk or you just want to say hi, please find me, follow me, and um, I'm happy to continue chatting with people. I've had so many wonderful conversations with people that I have never met. And the cool thing is meeting people that I've been engaged with online finally in person. That's pretty cool. All right. Well, thank you so much. And uh, to audience members, I'll try to send that out in the follow-up email that I do to you today. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Rami thank Lawson. you for having me. This is like the best way to start my day. Oh, good. Yeah. So, and I hope everybody feels that way too. Sometimes 
an early morning can be a challenge, but this is a great way to get us kicked off to, yeah. to that good feeling. And, and, um, I would say to, uh, having you be an example for our thoughts and our actions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Joe, could you please put up the online evaluation slide? Thank you, everybody. This address is in the chat. If you click on it, you can give us your feedback. It will also come to you in an email. And then tomorrow, we hope that you will come back to watch a documentary called Unsettled, Seeking Refuge in America. Um, we are really excited that the director of the documentary, Mr. Tom Shepard, <clears throat> will be there after the event to discuss with us. And um, the general theme here is um, refugees from around the world fleeing from persecution due to LGBTQIA plus status and, um, and what happens when they get to America. And that's what that's about. So that registration link is also in your chat. If you click on it, quickly before we shut down, you will be able to get yourself ready for tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m. CDT. Thanks, everybody. Have a great, great day. And thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Lawson. Thank you. Thank you.